<sighs> All right, we'll give it people a few minutes to log in. That sounds good. And I'm just going to be the, the voice from afar. Yes, actually, uh, we did just for those joining us, we just did a practice session. And of course, I still can't figure out how to get my video to work. So just pretend my lips in that picture are moving. We'll be good to go. Um, doo -doo -doo. So we have. I'm very excited about today. Um, first of all, the the voice with the um, just the talking head here. <laughs> I'm Sarah. Uh, Sarah Janke, I direct the Center for Fire Rescue and EMS Health Research. Most exciting um, role I have is that I am uh, in charge, currently in charge of Science to the Station, a health and wellness alliance, lovingly called by me the Science Alliance. And our goal is to uh, get people talking about how we can take science and evidence, get into the firehouse and then back again. So how can the fire service inform science so we're sure that what we're doing is relevant and matters. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for everyone who's joining us today. I'm really excited about this presentation. Really excited to have Amanda here. She is actually from Louisiana, although you can't um, tell by her accent. So I'm so it's I'm a tiny bit disappointed in that. But um, we were at, actually presenting together at Blue Card out in Phoenix, the Health and Wellness Symposium they did. And we were talking about um, therapy and, and how confusing it is. And it, and it came kind of actually from another board member too. Kepra Jack was talking about, um, you know, the presentations she was sitting through on behavioral health and the fire service and kind of, you know, what we, what we know, what we need to know, raising awareness around behavioral health issues, decreasing stigma, things like that, all that I think are absolutely important and fantastic things. Um, but she said, you know, what about like, what's after that? And I think fire service has done a fantastic job in a lot of places around behavioral health, reducing stigma, encouraging people to, you know, reach out, building peer teams. I think that peer team approach has been just, the, the, what's been done on that, like the last decade is just like, mind-blowing in terms of a cultural shift but um you know we always talk about if you when it moves beyond what can be handled around the kitchen table when it's um something that needs a warm handoff to a professional and that's where I think we kind of dropped the ball not not dropped the ball I think we didn't know that that ball needed to be juggled and and so there haven't been a lot of resources in the past in terms of even explaining like we say send them to a therapist like but what therapist do you send them to? There's a million different treatment modalities, you know, CBT, EMDR, all these things that um, in my lingo and Amanda's lingo, I'm like, oh yeah, we know what those are. But the average person um, walking in off the streets not going to know what those mean. Just like most people do not know, um, you know, when a, when fire service, they start talking about, well, SCBAs and when you're, you know, doing this and that, like the language is a different language. So where we need, we all believe that um, one of the things we need to start doing is creating a more ongoing conversation about what the hell do all those letters mean? <laughs> and of course, because we're the science alliance, we have to be kind of smart ass about our titles. So LMNOPs of therapy, what the, um, that actually does, WTF, do all those letters? Of course, I obviously meant what the fuck do all those letters mean? And Amanda, um, knows that. So I'm going to let her do a, an introduction of herself and just kind of walk you through this. But I think when we look at like, what are the next things that we need to be talking about in the fire service? What behavioral health is the next step? I think a big one is just like awareness and education that not all therapists are created equal. How do you find one? What do you, um, what do you look for? How, what if you hate your therapist? You know, what if you go to your first session and you're like, this person's an idiot? Well, Amanda has the answer for that. And, and I, I am excited that we've got folks on board today listening to this. I think this is the stuff we need to start pushing to peer teams. We need to start pushing out, you know, just education wise, awareness wise. Um, you know, I don't think everyone in the fire service has to be in therapy full time, but I think sometimes this is, it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's a good spot to be and it's a good thing to do and, um, God, but that's really overwhelming. If you've never done it before. So Amanda's going to walk us through this. Um, she is fantastic. She's got some fantastic experience doing some really cool programs. So I'm going to shut up now and let her um, 
let her take over. I mean, <laughs> so much for being here. Oh. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Amanda Weathers. I am technically the director of wellness at St. George Fire. That's in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I say technically because you probably are wondering, as did I when I first came on, is like, what is a director of wellness? What does that person do? So I'm in charge of physical fitness programming, mental fitness programming, and then research conducted with firefighters. So that's just a fancy way. Director of wellness is fancy way of saying um, that I'm responsible for all three areas for mental fitness. And that's my preferred terminology for counseling, because it really is a form of fitness. You're training the exact same aspects of fitness that you would through physical fitness. So strength, endurance, and flexibility, those are present in counseling as well. And I'll use the term counseling and therapy kind of interchangeably. Um, so just a quick background as, as to why I came to work with the fire service, because that's probably the number one question I get from firefighters, kind of checking that authenticity. Am I genuine? Why am I here? Why I work with firefighters? So um, I did my graduate work at LSU, Louisiana State University. And while I was doing my graduate work, my brother, who's a firefighter, was then, still is, um, called and informed me that he's, his department had lost a third member to suicide. So they had recently lost or suffered a loss of two paramedics, one firefighter to suicide. So he asked me um, as a future researcher and as a future clinician, so I was doing a dual degree at LSU, one in kinesiology, one in clinical mental health counseling. So he asked in either of those areas, is there something that can be done to lower the suicide rates because this can't keep continuing. So that's the, the background as to why I'm here, why I chose to work with firefighters specifically. Um, and I specialize in cultural competency, which is just another fancy word for saying um, a therapist that kind of understands the ins and outs of the fire service enough. So like if a firefighter came into me for therapy, I would understand the difference between a department and a station an engine and a ladder. I know kind of the differences between a volunteer and a career firefighter. Um, so it's it's important and we'll get to that in a bit, but it's important to have a culturally competent clinician. That way you're not spending your precious resources, both time and money, explaining that you work 24 hour shifts, that you work in shifts, that there's A, B, and C, uh, what a modified Kelly schedule looks like. That's what we run at St. George. Um, so let's get started. Let's understand what the fuck these letters mean, yeah? And forward, there we go. So we'll start with what is therapy? And this answer is going to depend on culture and time. So therapy has been in existence across multiple cultures, including warrior cultures. So I like to draw upon this example because um, I'm originally from Minnesota. And in Minnesota, we are trained in learning about Native American history. So we learned a lot about the different tribes throughout the United States. And in these tribes, there was always somebody dedicated to the well-being of the tribe. So that could be considered a form of therapy. Philosophers could also be um, considered a form a, of therapist because they're in charge of meaning making, understanding the human experience. Uh, physiologists could fall under that category too, spiritual leaders. So therapy, it, it's going to depend on who you ask and what culture and what time frame you're looking at. Um, so I mentioned briefly that part of therapy is making sense of the human experience. It also might be uh, targeted towards amending your relationship with yourself, your behavior, your feelings, your thoughts, or your relationship with others. And then, I don't know if you can see it over here, in this corner, uh, I mentioned something about preventative and participatory. So therapy is also going to be dependent on where your therapist is trained or how your therapist is trained rather. So uh, I'm trained in the discipline of clinical mental health counseling. So counselors conceptualize therapy um, from a wellness model as opposed to a medical model. And a wellness model means that you can come see a therapist, a counselor 
for any area of improvement. So you don't have to be on the last rung of life before you reach out to a therapist. We're here to help you understand um, how to improve your relationships. Again, like I said, with yourself or others, um, any area of improvement that you're looking for, we're there to assist, to guide, to promote insight, to challenge you, to generate different perspectives. So I guess my point is, it's especially from the wellness perspective, a wellness model, therapy means just improvement. That's kind of the simple way to put it. So I mentioned that I consider counseling a form of mental fitness. And that's because, like I mentioned before, you do work on mental strength, flexibility, and endurance. And you do this through training. So you have to put in the reps outside of the counseling session. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit later in the session, how important homework is outside of a counseling session. But from a therapist perspective, and of course I'm in therapy sessions quite often, I know that it doesn't involve just coming in, feeling sorry for yourself and crying. I know that might be the kind of prevailing notion of what counseling is, that it's self-indulgent or it's frivolous um, or it's weak. And it's really the exact opposite. When you go through a counseling session, it, it requires some significant work, both in the session and outside. It requires you to take a good hard look in the mirror and figure out what you'd like to amend in yourself and the things that you'd like to change, um, as well as the, the things that you would like to maintain. So it is a form of training, absolutely. So to answer the question, what is therapy? How do I find a therapist? You need to know a little bit about the levels of care. So what I found in working with firefighters is that there's this notion that there's only outpatient providers, and that's when you get that one-on-one -on -one therapy. So I'm considered an outpatient provider at St. George Fire. Um, but we also have inpatient as well, right? So these are the two levels of care that firefighters are the most familiar with. Inpatient is the acute care. So that would be appropriate if you are having suicidal thoughts, you have plans, means, and intent uh, to carry out the plan. So you would be appropriate for inpatient care. Outpatient, like I mentioned before, it's that one-on-one -on -one time with a therapist. So I, I arrange these levels of care on a tree to kind of get this point across that the severity of symptoms that you're experiencing will dictate what ring of the tree that you're on. And then in turn, that ring of the tree that you're on will inform what type of care is appropriate for you. So it's really important for me to bring up because if you go to an outpatient provider, but the severity of your symptoms really would be better served at intensive outpatient, which is primarily group therapy. And it, as the name implies, it's intensified, right? So you meet three to four times per week, three times each group. So as the name implies, it's intensive. Um, but I wouldn't want somebody to seek outpatient care and then be referred to intensive outpatient and then internalize that message as I'm too broken to be fixed. I'm too broken for you to help me. Um, it's just that you're not on the, the level or the ring of the tree that would be best suited at outpatient. And I hope it, that's making sense. So I don't want anybody to seek out help. They're fine. Okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get some help, go to outpatient. And then the outpatient provider says, mm, you're better served at a different level of care. So now you understand that there are different levels of care. And if you're familiar with the center of excellence, um, that's an example of residential care. So I'm going to be focusing mostly on outpatient providers today and how to find a therapist um, in the outpatient setting. Let's see if I can move this around a bit. So I'm going to focus on therapy in Louisiana just to kind of break it down a bit. Um, I know that we have multiple people joining from multiple different states. And the unfortunate piece about explaining what the fuck do all these letters mean is that the terminology for clinicians differs state to state. So there's no standardized terminology, but I'm gonna to try to do my best to, to help you out if you're from a state other than Louisiana. So these are the four primary types of therapists. So if you go seek 
therapy in an outpatient setting, you'll likely work with one of these four. We have the clinical social worker, the clinical mental health counselor, a clinical psychologist, and a marriage and family therapist. So it is a marriage and family therapist is a, it's a counselor, but specializes in, like the name implies, marriage and family. Uh, so we've got the four here. These four do not focus on prescription. They're there to conduct therapy with you. Like I mentioned before, their abbreviation is going to be different depending on the discipline that your therapist is trained in and what state you live in. So for a clinical social worker, let me break down these letters for you, that L indicates license. That's an important piece. Those other letters are going to indicate how your therapist is trained. So here we've got L for license, clinical social worker. So the L shows that they're licensed, the CSW shows where they're trained. So a social worker is going to be trained in the discipline of social work. And they'll have a, um, a minimum requirement of a master's degree to practice therapy. So I'm going to talk quite a bit on licensing and licensing boards throughout this presentation because it's super important. Um, so when you find out your educational background of your therapist, it's just it's nice information to have, but it's not necessary because the state licensing board is going to make sure that your therapist meets the minimum requirements for education. I'm going over this though, because the letters behind somebody's name often does include their education. And I'll explain it a bit better probably in, um, in a separate slide. So let me move down the list. We've got a clinical mental health counselor. This is the discipline that I'm trained in. We have LPCs or PLBCs that can uh, conduct therapy legally in Louisiana. Again, we've got the L's that indicate licensed and the PC indicates uh, what area we're trained in. So professional counselor. So LPC is licensed professional counselor. And again, we have to have a master's degree, minimum master's degree um, to practice therapy. So clinical psychologists are a bit of an anomaly because they don't have an L behind their um, behind their names. They're going to have a, either a PhD or a PsyD. Um, clinical psychologists are also different because you have to have a doctorate to practice at this level, whereas the others, you have to have a master's, minimum of a master's. Um, and then marriage and family therapist, again, we've got the L that indicates licensure, and the MFT is going to explain how or what discipline they're trained in. So marriage and family therapy, that's what the LMFT is. Again, you have to have a master's, a minimum master's um, to practice as a licensed ma marriage and family therapist in Louisiana. So I mentioned right here, you'll need to check with your state licensing board. I'm going to go into that in greater detail in the next slides. Uh, another important piece, though, that certifications and education level do not equal licensure. So like uh, counselors, for example, we have to go through a three-year KCREP accredited program. So I won't go into what KCREP means, but we have to go to an accredited program, go through school for three years that requires internship and practicum, so our form of clinicals. And then after that, we have two to five years that we practice under our own license and somebody else's license. Um, so all of that is very different than a certification. That's what we have to do in addition to passing a licensure exam and submitting all the paperwork to a licensing board, those are the extra steps that we have to do to be licensed. So me graduating with a master's degree in counseling doesn't automatically make me a counselor is what I'm getting at. There's extra steps that I have to do. The supervision, years of supervision, um, and then submitting the appropriate paperwork, passing, to, passing the licensure exam to be considered a licensed counselor. So hopefully I'm making sense. I can't see anyone's faces, so I can't tell if your eyes are glazed over yet. This, if if yeah. eyes were to glaze over, it would be on this slide. We're super excited about it. Are you? <laughs> you can't I'm talking to face, I'm talking crazy. into the abyss, and I was like, "Geez, there's a lot. I'm throwing the letters at you right away." Um, but if you have questions, get Sierra. Are they able to participants able to just kind of pipe in? I believe they can't, um, they cannot talk, but we have a spot where they can ask questions. Okay. So yeah. Questions in chat. Out. Yes. So this, I promise this is probably the most complex slide. So just to recap, yes. there's four different types of therapists. If you go seek therapy, you're either going to see a 
clinical social worker, clinical mental health counselor, a clinical psychologist, or a marriage and family therapist. And what you're looking for for those letters behind their name, their education requirements, that's kind of extraneous information because your licensing board is going to make sure that your therapist has that. What you want to focus on is the L's, which indicates license. And then the other letters behind the L is going to indicate how your therapist is trained and what discipline. So there's the synopsis. I mentioned that with um, the terminology for therapists is going to differ state to state. So I chose to juxtapose um, Louisiana and Minnesota, because that's where I'm originally from. You can see that there's kind of variations of the same thing. So it's not PMOQ, you know, it's going to have an L associated. Um, the label is going to have an L associated with it because it indicates L for licensed. Um, so you can see here, LCSW is equivalent to LICSW in Minnesota. The LPC is equivalent to the LPCC in Minnesota. And then the LMFTs are essentially the same. So don't panic if you're from a state other than Louisiana, you're going to see some sort of variation of uh, the licensure like labeling, I guess, for lack of a better term. So I'm going to bring all this information together. We've got a rando therapist here. Here's their education. Good information but it's not absolutely necessary to make your decision. Then we have your licensure. As you just learned that L stands for licensed, PC is for professional counselor. So this person is, this rando therapist is licensed and trained in the discipline of counseling. So this is something we didn't talk about before, it's certifications. A certification, I did briefly mention this, a certification is not equivalent to licensure. So if somebody is certified in an area, it just indicates that they have specialized training in a particular area, but they're not licensed to practice. So you might have somebody who's licensed and has certifications. In fact, that's what you would be looking for. But if you're, if you're working with somebody that's only certified, not licensed, that's a sticky situation. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because it happens in the world. We had a woman approach St. George Fire wanting to work with not only firefighters here, but in the entire state, um, presented herself as both a doctor and a licensed counselor. Um, one check with the state licensure board, and I found that she was actually neither. So there are some people out there that kind of, I hate to use the word pray, but um take advantage of people that aren't, aren't well-versed in all those letters. So I don't want to like strike the fear of God in people, but this is exactly why we're having this type of training. So you can kind of distinguish what's the difference between a certification and a licensed person. Does this person need to have a PhD? Does, do they need to have an MED or an MA? Um, so let's go to the next one. Now we're going to delve into how to find a therapist and I've broken it down. I'm, let me back up. I'm very logistic space, right? I'd, if somebody's trying to explain this to me on a theoretical level, it, it, it does me no good. And it does me no good to explain that to firefighters who might be taking this information, trying to find their own therapist. So I'm going to be very logistic space here. I've laid it out in four steps. These are the exact same four steps that I go through when I'm finding a therapist um, for one of my firefighters out in the community, because that's in addition to doing in-house counseling, my other job is to put a firefighter or anybody of any rank at the fire department in contact with a therapist should they need a specialized type of care or a higher level of care. So this is part of my job, and I'm going to show you essentially how to do my job. I'm going to put myself out of a job, is what I'm saying. So I mentioned that cultural comp culturally competent counselors are super important, especially with the fire service. I understand that sometimes I only have one shot to find a, a therapist that truly understands the fire service. So as mentioned before, you're not a firefighter coming in and using your first session that you're paying for likely to explain that you work, you know, 24 hour shifts or the type of, um, the type of calls that you run on. Your therapist has to have an understanding of that you run medical calls, what you can see on those medical calls. 
extrication, so MVAs in addition to fires. So it's good for a therapist to have this background so they can know what to expect when you come in and they can kind of mentally prepare themselves so they're not falling apart. Um, that's, that's the number one complaint I've heard from firefighters is they'll go and they'll find a therapist, somebody who's maybe not culturally competent and the therapist falls to pieces and can't handle um, the experiences that you're trying to relay that's therapeutic for you. And then all of a sudden the firefighters turn around and helping out the, the therapist. So it is important to find a culturally competent therapist if possible. There's, we don't have like an abundance of them in the United States, but it, the army of culturally competent clinicians is starting to grow. So let me stop jabbering and explain how to find these culturally competent therapists. Um, I mentioned we're going to be very logistic space, right? Here is the full phrase that I use. Start with Google, culturally competent therapist firefighters directory, because there are a few directories out there. And if you type that into Google, it's going to show up three different responses um, in addition to others, but these are the three that I use, the certified first responder counselor. So this is a certification program. Again, this isn't licensure. This is in addition to licensure. Um, but it requires the therapist to go through 50 hours of additional training to understand how to work with first responders. So they then cover information like moral injury um, and also might encourage the therapist to term post-traumatic stress as post-traumatic stress injury as opposed to PTSD. So, so it's like those little nuances that I think really make a difference in working with a firefighter. So the Certified First Responder Counselor uh, website has all the therapists that have, it lists all the therapists that have gone through that training. Um, in addition to that 50 hours of training, the therapist is required to do, I believe, at least a 10 hour ride along. So they can at least see a small snapshot of what you experience. They're not going to be a seasoned firefighter by any means, but they will have an understanding of the culture of station life, which is super important too. Redline's unique to Florida. So if you're a Florida firefighter, you are in luck because they have a database. Um, let me back up. They, they have a clinician awareness training program where a clinician can go and learn in two days um, a little bit more about how to treat firefighters. And then the second day of the training is um, focused on uh, allowing the therapist to go through some daily tasks that a firefighter might go through. Um, and then after the training, all these therapists dump into a database called Redline. So if you're in Florida, you can go to Redline's website. You can pull up a directory of all the therapists that have gone through that training that have some cultural competency under their belt. And then the last one is the National Volunteer Fire Council. And this will pop up a directory that is vetted by the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance. Um, Unfortunately, in Louisiana, I think there's only like two or three that are listed. So you might be in luck and uh, come from a state that has more people in that directory. So that's step one. Go to the directories, find somebody that might look like a good fit for you, and then go to Psychology Today's website. Um, not every single therapist is going to have a Psychology Today uh, profile but a lot of them do. And this is where you can find information about what insurance they take. If they offer a sliding scale, which let me back up and explain what that is. If the therapy is too costly for you, you can ask the therapist if they do a sliding scale fee and they'll kind of adjust the rates based off of your income or your ability to pay. So you can check psychology today and it gives a profile of the therapist, gives you a little bit of background as to how they approach therapy, what they might specialize in, um, additional certifications that they have, insurance. And this is when you're gonna run into a, a hell of a lot more letters. So let me explain what these are. Um, if we go back to the rando therapist slide, it has a person's name, their education, which as we've discussed, kind of extraneous information, it gives the licensure that you can tell if they're licensed, where they were trained or how, what discipline they're trained in, and then their certifications. On the Psychology Today website, there's going to be more letters, CBT, DBT, ACT, EMDR, PE, NET, CPT. That's a whole lot, a lot. So when you see well, most of them included T in there of sorts because it's indicating what type of therapy 
your therapist um, use as their theoretical orientation. So when we're going through training to be a therapist, we're urged to find a theoretical orientation that um, speaks to us and is effective with a population, our intended population. So for me, my intended population was firefighters, and I had to find a theoretical orientation um, that kind of fit well with that. And by theoretical orientation, I mean it gives you kind of a, a framework or it gives the, the therapist a type of framework. So kind of similar to religion, right? It gives you a structure to understand life and death. Well, a theoretical framework gives us a structure to understand why problems occur and how we might treat those problems. Um, so very quickly, and I'll go into greater detail about C CBT and EMDR, but CBT stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Um, it's a predominant form of therapy in the Western world. DBT is short for dialectical behavior therapy, which is considered a third wave therapy. It's a, it's a newer therapy. Um, all of these are evidence-based, meaning that they've been researched to make sure that they are indeed effective. Um, but dialectical, dialectical behavior therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy, which is the ACT, are both kind of uh, draw upon mindfulness. The ones in red that I've included here, EMDR, that's short for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. I'll go over that in um, greater detail in the next slide or at the end of the presentation. Um, prolonged exposure therapy is PE, narrative exposure therapy is NET, and cognitive processing therapy is CPT. So the ones in red are the therapies that are indicated for treatment of post-traumatic stress, and that's of relevance um, to this population because firefighters are at increased risk for um, experiencing symptoms of post-traumatic stress. So I've talked about this before and I, I realize I'm borderline beating a dead horse here, but it is important to verify licensure. Um, each state is going to have their own licensing boards and I use the word boards, plural, because to complicate matters, each discipline, social work, professional counseling, psychologists, and marriage and family therapists likely have different licensing boards. So this is kind of when I lose people like, oh my gosh, this is so much work. But the licensing board does um, quite a bit of work for you on your behalf. First and foremost, its job, whether it's for clinical social workers or licensed professional counselors or psychologists, the job of the board is to protect the public and that public includes you and you deserve to be protected. Particularly if you are just kind of tiptoeing into this crazy world of therapy where there's tons of letters and there's really not a guideline other than kind of what we're going over today and how to navigate it. So its job is to protect the public a licensing board's job is also to establish standards. So they're going to make sure that if your therapist is licensed, that we've gone through an accredited program, that we have learned specific core competencies, um, including like how to listen to people, how to talk to people, learn about all those different therapies that we just went over briefly in the, in the previous slide. Uh, but it also requires us to have supervision hours to have clinicals and continuing education. So our education doesn't stop once we've completed a master's or a PhD or PsyD. So the licensing board kind of takes on that burden. So you don't have to check on that information. The licensing board does it on your behalf. And um, in addition to that, as I mentioned, it protects the public. It ensure the licensing board will ensure that we are trained in the laws specific to our state, including the ethical guidelines and the ethical laws that we have to um, follow. This includes confidentiality, which is super, super important. You want your, your therapist to be trained in um, how to maintain the confidentiality because it's in our best interest to protect your confidentiality. It's in your best interest as well. So that's my spiel. Um, it sounds like I'm being paid off by licensing boards, doesn't it? Um, but it is important because I wouldn't want somebody to find a therapist who's really a life coach. You know what I mean? We want to avoid that. 
So you've looked um, for a directory. You found a therapist that looks interesting. You looked at their Psychology Today website, gives you a little bit of information about their pricing, how long their ses sessions are. And by the way, counseling sessions typically last 50 minutes or 90 minutes if you're going through EMDR. And I'll explain what EMDR is um, at the end of the presentation. You've got a sense of how this person approaches problems, understands problems, and um, how they conceptualize potential solutions. You get a sense of if they specialize in a certain area, for example, trauma or substance use or marriage and family therapy. So the last step is to do an initial consultation. And I think this is a step that maybe isn't widely known, but majority of therapists offer a 10 to 15 minute phone consultation. And this is where you get to essentially interview your therapist to see if they're a good fit. I've had quite a few firefighters ask me, it's like, okay, well, if I make this call, like, what do, what do I say? What do I ask? There's two guiding documents that I, I draw from. One's from the APA, the American Psychological Association, or the IAFF. So I'll show you examples of these questions that are on the documents provided by the APA and the IAFF. So tell me a little bit about your background in working with first responders. That's your first question, your entry to check on that therapist's cultural competency. So if you found them in the directory, the likelihood that they've sought out experiences to improve their cultural competency, whether it's the CFRC training or it's doing ride-alongs, like that's um, the method I chose to be more culturally competent. This question kind of gives you that, um, first glance as to whether or not they might be a good fit. That's if cultural competency is important to you. Uh, the second one is super important. It's near and dear to my heart. Do you assign homework, which you might be wincing at and saying, no, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not looking for homework here. Um, but my point is this, that you'll have to do some reps outside of the counseling session. So if I'm expecting, um, you to be able to change your relationship with yourself or with others, to amend your behavior, your thought, your feelings, it's going to take more than once a week, 50 minutes. So I ask my clients to put in their reps outside of the sessions and their homework can be a variety of things. I have some clients that watch um, masterclass videos and come back and then we process the information together. I have some clients that listen to books or they actually, they read the books, come in, we process that information. It's all pertinent to their presenting issue as well. Um, some do worksheets. Some are working through the like acceptance and com commitment therapy workbook. And we do that together. So they're doing things, they're kind of testing out new ways of being outside of a counseling session. And that's why it's important to ask the therapist if they assign homework. Um, I found with firefighters, it's kind of a more of a structured task oriented population, which is probably one of the reasons I kind of gravitate towards um, firefighters. And in giving homework, it gives you structure, you know what to expect, you know, kind of the general topic of what you'll be discussing for the next counseling session. Um, and it also indicates that your therapist expects you to do work outside of the session um, and it promotes more autonomy. So if you're not doing something outside of the counseling session, then you're more likely to be reliant on the therapist to be doing the work, the heavy lifting. Um, and I would, I, I'd be cautious about therapists that are not promoting autonomy outside of the counseling sessions because you don't want it, it, at the end of the day you're not going to have your therapist in your pocket at all times I guess is what I'm saying so you want to do the work outside and you want to see in advance if your counselor or your therapist is kind of on the same mind wave mindset with that so if all the information I've just given you is overwhelming you which I tend to have that effect on people um because it's a lot of information if all this fails, you could use an organization called Next Strong. So I had a phone call with them last week. I don't know if y'all are familiar with Next Strong, but it's an organization that helps place first responders with a 
culturally competent clinicians. So they take all those steps that I just went through, steps one through four, and they essentially do them for you and then put you in contact with a therapist. Now, I suppose the only drawback here is that you don't have a chance to kind of do your homework um, in advance. Somebody else is doing it for you. So I guess it really depends on um, where you are as far as symptoms are concerned. So if you are on the last rung of life, it's going to be difficult to go through all four of those steps. I realize that. So you might pick one of those steps. You might reach out to next rung and see if they might be able to help you place with a culturally competent counselor. If you have a peer support person at your department, most peer supporters are linked to at least one clinician. So they might be able to refer you to that clinician. And if that person's not your cup of tea, they have an ethical responsibility to give you referrals to other clinicians. So there are some options where um, somebody else can kind of do the legwork on your behalf. What I would urge is that if you're even considering counseling, why not go through those steps on your own when you have that headspace for it? It's kind of preparing in advance. Um, and I'll, I'll use this analogy. So when you first get to work, when, you, when you're coming on shift, you check your truck. You make sure that you have all the equipment you need on the truck. And say you're in charge of, um, like you work primarily MVAs you don't have your extrication tools there. You wouldn't say, well, I hope we don't have to do an extrication today. Let's just kind of ignore that we don't have anything set in place and like hope it doesn't happen. So it's the same concept here, kind of prepare in advance as opposed to um, ignoring the fact that you could prepare in advance, if that makes sense. So I mentioned, I focused a lot, quite a bit on um, finding a culturally competent counselor. You also may want to focus in on a therapist that offers a specialization. And I mentioned the specializations before, um, substance use, trauma, marriage and family, and grief. Those are kind of the one, two, three, four uh, heavy hitters for firefighters that I've found through personal experience. So if you want to find somebody who specializes in trauma, which I highly suggest because if you think of it this way, you have a, a specialized issue and there are specific therapeutic modalities that are evidence-based that work well to treat post-traumatic stress, whether it's full-blown PTSD or it's subsyndromal or a partial PTSD. So that means that you have some of the symptoms, but not all. Uh, if you have a specialized issue, it would make sense to go somebody who specializes in that issue as opposed to your kind of like general practitioner therapist. So I'll focus in on trauma because that's, as mentioned before, it's a prevalent issue in the fire service. You can check MDRIA. It's the EMDR International Association. It's a website. I'm going to walk you through how to go through all four steps, but it's a website that um, governs EMDR training. So it doesn't offer the training, but it does govern EM, govern. EMDR training, and I'm not sure. Mm. Nope, I can't share the whole screen. So I'll kind of walk you through it. So you go to EMDR's website or EMDRIA's website. You click on find a therapist. All the therapists in your region pop up that have been trained in EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, which is a form of therapy effective in treating post-traumatic stress, whether PTSD or subsyndromal. Uh, take that information. You go through the same steps that we just went through before. Find a therapist, go to psychology today, see if they have a profile. If they do, it's going to give them a background information. It should mention that they've been certified or they're trained in EMDR. Um, and then the next step is you make a phone call, see if that person's a good fit using those guiding questions from the APA or the IAFF or a combination of both. So that's finding a specialization, repeating the steps two through four that we just went through. So you've finally done all the legwork and you have your appointment set up. So what happens next? And we're gonna remove the mystery from it. 
your therapist will likely have you complete kind of a, an intake packet. And that'll be either online or it'll be in paper format when you come into the office first. Um, likely have you assess questions on potentially drinking behavior, um, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress. And it may kind of focus in on your presenting issue, which is your, your main reason for, for seeking out therapy. During your first session, your therapist may go over the Declaration of Practices and Procedures or the informed consent. That's the paperwork that protects both you uh, as a client and me as a clinician um, from disclosing your information. It's, it's not in anyone's best interest to disclose any information that's being spoken of in a counseling session. So that's the paperwork, the informed consent. Next, your therapist will likely go through an intake assessment or a psychosocial evaluation. So I do like to um, mention this to firefighters that have never gone to therapy before because during an intake session, your therapist could be taking notes and it's going to feel a little bit more sterile or clinical because it is. We're taking it an assessment. Um, I like to liken it as... Um, using the solar system as, as an example. So you might be coming in for a specific planet, but during the intake assessment or the psychosocial evaluation, I'm looking at the other planets in your solar system or your constellation. So I can understand why this planet might be problematic, how it relates to the other planets. Um, so the intake assessment is gonna be asking history questions, history of um, mental, issues in your family. It's going to ask questions like, what are your strengths? What would you like to focus on? And that all that information is going to inform the diagnosis. So if you are going to a therapist and you are hoping to have your therapy sessions reimbursed by insurance, you'll have to have a diagnosis. Um, and that's up to the, the therapist. They're just going to base that information or they'll base the diagnosis off the information that you've been giving them. Um, quite a bit of that information is going to come from the intake assessment. And I mentioned uh, right here that those who don't take insurance, like for me, example, I'm employed by St. George Fire Department, so I don't have to worry about insurance, which means that I don't have to have a, a, a diagnosis. I don't have to label somebody. I do, however, have to have a diagnostic impression, which um, kind of guides what type of, of treatments I might be using. And that's going to be based off of what the person's experiencing. So we do have to have, everyone has to have a diagnosis or a diagnostic impression. Whether or not you need a diagnosis is really pr primarily driven by um, insurance companies. So treatment planning is meant to be a collaborative effort. That is where you are deciding what type of um, therapeutic modality might work best for your presenting issue and how long your treatment might last. As far as frequency for treatment, there's a variety. So if you're looking at an outpatient provider, you might see that therapist once per week, once every other week, maybe once per month in maintenance. I'll explain what maintenance is in a moment. Um, at St. George, I see my clients every other week. So everyone sees me at least twice a month or the clients that I have see me twice a month. So after your treatment plan is um, set up and it's likely going to be discussed with you or either explicitly or implicitly, you'll continue your therapeutic journey. You might be in counseling for a few months, depends on the presenting issue. You might be in counseling for a year. You might be in counseling for a few weeks. Um, I know with my own clients, sometimes I'll see person a uh, person once just to process a bad call, to kind of descale as the scales are accruing. And by scales, I mean like the potentially traumatic um, events to which firefighters are exposed. Some clients I've seen for over a year and they are um, in what's called the maintenance phase. So the very end of treatment is called termination, which is a really severe uh, phrase for the end of counseling. What I have seen um, to work best, again, this is from personal experience, is maintenance as opposed to termination. So that means that uh, a person continues that relationship with a the therapist, but it's very scaled back. So they might see me on an as-needed basis, or they might come in once per month, 
um, as a form of mental health maintenance. So there's really nothing going on, but if something does pop up, they already have an established relationship with the therapist and they don't have to kind of re-up their counseling sessions. They just have to, at least this is how it works at St. George. They just have to let me know, Hey, I'm coming in for my monthly, my monthly checkup, essentially. And I've been going on and on, and you're hearing about therapy from a clinician perspective. So if you're interested in learning more about um, the therapy process, why somebody might seek out therapy, um, someone's experiences in therapy, I highly recommend this documentary. It's called The The Call We Carry, which was put on by Tacoma Fire Department. So you can find that documentary on YouTube for free. And I have a resources page at the end of the presentations, and it includes the the link for the call we carry. So for the ambitious, for all of those that have hung hung with this presentation, I'm going to go over two more types of lettering, and those are the therapeutic orientations or the therapeutic modalities. And I want to focus in on the two heavy hitters, EMDR for um, trauma, and then CBT, which is on the next slide. And that's the most kind of predominant form of um, therapy. So EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing is a form of therapy that's effective in treating not only post-traumatic stress, but depression and anxiety as well. I'm most familiar with it in the context of post-traumatic stress. Um, it's a different type of therapy. It requires bilateral movements. I'll explain what that means. So your therapist may be um, having you process a traumatic event while moving your fingers like this or something that's causing a bilateral movement. So uh, the two hemispheres of the brain, it's causing it to speak and that it's not completely understood why this works, but it helps with the processing. So it puts distance between you and the traumatic experience. So if you look at it or consider it in terms of volume. If there's a traumatic event that you've experienced and the volume's really loud, it's you've not processed it. Um, going through EMDR can turn that volume down. So it's kind of more manageable. It gives you space between you and that event. So it's not quite as distressing. Um, it does sound like voodoo. And I've had quite a few firefighters ask me, okay, so it, this, it, that's hypnosis. That's what you're talking about. It's so it's not hypnosis. Um, something about the bilateral movements though helps with the processing. If you want to learn more information, I highly recommend the the body keeps the score. So chapter 15 of that book focuses on EMDR. Chapter 16 focuses on yoga, which is what I study. Um, but the body keeps the body keeps the score is a good book if you're interested in learning more just about trauma in general. Why? why the body reacts to trauma um, in certain ways, what type of treatments are out there. Um, it's written by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who is a, um, I believe he's a neuropsychiatrist, but he focuses on the treatment of trauma. And the, the second book I recommend, Every Memory Deserves Respect. And that book, the entire book is focused on explaining EMDR, both from a clinician perspective and a client's perspective who's gone through EMDR. So I've had quite a few clients. I've recommended that book if they want to learn more about the process before they pursue EMDR, just so they get a better idea of um, what they're getting into. And then finally, CBT is short for cognitive behavioral therapy. It is also like EMDR. It's kind of a, a theoretical orientation or a therapeutic modality for treating quite a few uh, mental health concerns, depression, anxiety, there's trauma-focused CBT that's used for trauma. Um, but cognitive behavioral therapy, its primary focus is on cognition. So I mentioned in one of the beginning slides that some, when you come into a therapist, we're likely going to be focusing on thoughts, feeling, or behavior, or all three. The entry point for those practicing cognitive behavioral therapy is cognitions, your thought process. So the rationale is that if you can amend your thoughts, if you can challenge them, if you can replace them with something a bit more adaptive, then that in turn will influence your behavior and in turn your feelings. 
So that's kind of a quick overview of two of the kind of primary modalities, EMDR for trauma, CBT treats quite a few um, mental health concerns, and both are very much evidence-based and um, have been extensively studied. CBT probably more so um, in comparison to EMDR. So I don't want to overwhelm with any more letters. We got through it. Um, <laughs> for any immediate support, and this is if you're in an acute phase, so you remember the, the tree, this is like at the center of the tree when you're needing some help and you need to talk to someone immediately, you can call 988. That's the new number for the suicide um, hotline. There's also NextRung that I mentioned, and that's the organization that can help place you with a therapist in your area, and they'll do kind of the legwork for you. Uh, Safe Call Now and Fire EMS Helpline are both kind of like peer support hotlines, I guess, for lack of a better term, and it provides uh, the person that you'll be speaking to is somebody from the first responder community. And I know for NextRong, it's marketed as for all first responders, but when I talk to them, it's firefighter-based. <laughs> They're firefighters running NextRong. That's my contact information. If all the information I dumped on you is still confusing, which I can understand if it is. It's a lot of information I went over, but I'm happy to answer questions. Um, right now, I'm functioning as the kind of point person for mental health in the state of Louisiana. So if you're a Louisiana firefighter, I will know a culturally competent therapist in your area or one that can do teletherapy for you. And then these are all the resources that I mentioned. Um, we've got the questions to ask when you set up an initial consult both from the APA and the IAFF have a lot of resources if you want to learn more about trauma-focused um, therapies, ones that are effective in treating trauma, the cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure, narrative exposure therapy, um, EMDR. There's MDRIA's website at the very bottom. That's where you can find an MDRIA or MDRIA, an EMDR uh, trained therapist if you're looking to address trauma. And then some other additional resources. Um, utilizing EMDR with fire service members is a IFF webinar, and they have quite a few webinars that they offer um, for clinicians, for non-members, where you can learn a little bit more about uh, therapeutic modalities that are being used with firefighters. That's a, a longer web webinar. It's about two hours, but if you want to jump in around the hour mark, that's when they start explaining EMDR. So if you're interested, there are definitely some resources out there that can walk you through the process. And then there's the, the Call We Carry documentaries um, URL, if you'd like to learn more from firefighters. That'd be it, Sarah. I mean, fantastic. I felt like that was um, amazing, overwhelming, but we we're <laughs> it and we're posting it on the science lines so um so we will get it figured out and people can follow this i also there were some great suggestions about could we just do a table of what the different initials mean and i think that'd be phenomenal and we can get the graphics folks to put it um to put it together in a really nice way and do the resource stuff if that would be okay with you and we can just yes. do it that way. you're yep. talking about like this table or this table um, I think all the letters, I mean, we can do a whole element of the, of, um, of therapies. And I think it would be, yeah, I think that was the, I can't remember who, um, suggested it, but I think it was brilliant. So I agree. Let's get that put together. Um, and I think the open note here is, uh, let's see, great to have that last chart and agree on the table of all the letters. So let's do that. Yep. Call We Carry is an excellent, important topic that's nice to see discussing with regards to uh, fire and EMS. Absolutely. Agree. It's mm -hmm. exciting, right? Like, I think it's all actually very exciting that we're, we're at the point um, that people, that we need to start talking about what therapy is and what to look for and how to access it and all that kind of stuff is, that would not be a, um, I mean, we had a dozen people jump on and we've got, I know um, a dozen people who signed up that weren't able to make it. And usually we get a lot of watches afterwards. So that's, I mean, pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool stuff. Um, yeah, it's quite a bit. Like I'll, I'll admit, um, I was discussing it with my brother and I said, 
I hate to present a complex topic and make it even more complex. So I'm hoping that um, people can refer to the, the presentation and walk through the steps on their own time. Um, I definitely recommend going through the steps and finding a therapist when you are not in the thick of things. Yeah. Just have it in your back pocket. And if you never need it, fine. Fantastic. But if you do need it, that's also fantastic because you've already done the legwork and when you have the headspace and yeah, it's, I, I think for the folks on the call who are, um, who are like coordinating behavioral health programs for their department or on your health and wellness committee, getting this stuff out, having some resources, knowing who people in your department, like, um, you know, and different therapists are good for different things, right? Like one might be great for your, you know, 12 year old super hormonal daughter and it might not be the same one that's good for you my daughter's therapist is fantastic but um and I couldn't do what she does obviously but um I I think that we it probably wouldn't be the same therapist that I would pick so I think that um it, the more departments can kind of like that I someone mentioned prospective hindsight one time and I was like oh that's that's fucking brilliant like think forward and think what am I going to wish I had in place when the shit hits the fan. And I'm like, yes, 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 yes. So I, I like that concept of what do I need to be ready for? So I yeah. also like that you brought up, um, that not, you wouldn't hire every single therapist, just like you no. would every single person. So like unknown fact, therapists have therapists. It's our form yeah. of health maintenance and it helps us descale as the scales are accruing, which is the same expectation I have of our firefighters to be proactive, be it preventative. Um, and so since therapists have therapists, I've been through therapy. My very first therapist, um, she was nice, but I didn't have that rapport, that connection. I didn't feel understood. And this is before I was trained as a therapist. I walked out of that session. I was like, fuck this. Like this is for the birds. Yep. How could it possibly be effective? And it's because I didn't have that, that alliance with that therapist. So if there's anything to be taken away from this, uh, for those of you that are still on um, the presentation is know that that therapist works for you. That's why it's important to have that interview. And by saying works for you, I mean, you are, you're free to let them go if that's not the right person for you. And there's no hard feelings. In fact, yes. to not take it personally, our job is in service of you. If I'm not somebody's cup of tea, it sure as hell is my job to make sure that I do find somebody that works yeah. well. Like that's the whole point, but not to give up. Um, if you interview the first person and that's not the right candidate for you, um, move on. It's yeah, move on. It's part, it's part of the process. And you, you wouldn't want to kind of waste your time with somebody that wasn't a good fit. That's why the initial consultation is so nice. It's, you get an idea of how that person operates their personality. Um, I know with firefighters, like it's pretty hard to find somebody like if your therapist is like fragile, like a wilting flower or can't handle swearing and can't handle <laughs> hearing about grits and gore, then that might, that's not the person for you. But that doesn't mean that therapy is not for you. Right. There. That's a more right. concise way to put it, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. That is absolutely right. Um, uh, Chief asked, is it okay to share information from these slides, certainly citing and crediting the source? Are you cool with that, Amanda? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The more people that have this information and can refer to it, the better, because I went over an astronomical amount of info. <laughs> Yes. To, to expect yes. people to memorize this and be like, yes, I know what I'm doing now. Um, it would be crazy of me. Well, yeah. if you cool sharing your PowerPoint, we'll get it to our graphic designer and get some of the, um, get the table made up and stuff like that. And, you know, put, put your name on it. And so everyone can ask you questions and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Me, okay. Now I'm seeing, I can see the, let's Everything see. Everything, they loved it. The question it answers, I'm finally understanding. Oh, yes. Yeah, I think it was great. Well, thank, thank you. Everyone, Amanda, if you can email that to Mel and we'll get it to Jeannie. And we'll just, thanks for everyone for jumping on. And I um, hope this is helpful information to share with your departments. And 
We got another one this afternoon. If anyone wants to hear the kickoff to Nerdstock Unplugged. Dun, dun, dun. We're very excited about that too. So, so hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.